Okay, now they're coming out of the woodwork. We got a few uh, logged in now. So here's the plan for today. We're going to cover modules five and six. Module five is going to be the spanning tree protocol. And module six will be ether channel feature, which is a Cisco proprietary feature. Link aggregation is what it's called in the industry. Okay, and then Thursday we'll come in person to person in uh, our Cisco laboratory on South Campus and do a, a ether, ch ether channel lab. Um, okay, let's see, I need to stop sharing this and I want to share something else, which is um, the files I'm gonna be showing to you guys. Let's see, I'm gonna share application, I'm gonna share a tab, and it's gonna be this one here, I think. So you guys should be able to be seeing, oh, that's really fuzzy looking, isn't it? Oh, I'm terrible, I'm terribly sorry about that. Okay, so I'm gonna, for, for the, the spanning tree protocol, I'm gonna use a uh, slideshow that uh, has good graphics in it rather than the official one. So I'm gonna be using the, this one right here, this outline. Uh, and then for the module six ether channel, I'll just use the, uh, the standard one. So I'm going to cover this one first, Chapter 3. It's called Chapter 3, STP from EX. In the old curriculum was Chapter 3. Cisco likes to sort of mix and match and change the chapter numbers whenever they revise these things. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing that. And I should be able to start sharing a PowerPoint slideshow, this one. Oh, and it should. Let's... Let me go back here to the PowerPoint slideshow, rewind it. Am I on the slideshow here? Okay, there we go. Okay, hang with a second here while I let you recheck attendance here. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four. I'm missing somebody. Let's see, I got you. Oh. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is this uh, spanning tree protocol thing, which is a protocol that uh, not just Cisco devices. This is an open standard thing. Spanning tree protocol was invented by one of my uh, computer heroes, Roddy Perlman as a method of uh, allowing us to hook up lots of redundant paths between Ethernet switches and not getting three big problems that we're going to talk about. So uh, if I stop sharing this and start sharing this packet tracer window for just a second. If you go into take two real Ethernet switches. Packet Tracer is kind of close. It's a simulation. It's kind of like a macromedia flash simulation of real devices. So if I go down to my Packet Tracer and choose to connect a couple of uh, wires, I'll connect port one to port one, like we, just like we did in the lab. And then I'll connect. Notice that the lights are orange on the real switches. The lights are orange for about, oh, most of a minute. And then they're going to change to green again. And while we're waiting for that to happen, I'm going to go ahead and connect a second set of wires. So they're orange, they're orange, we're watching, we're waiting. And eventually what's going to happen here is on a real switch and on this packet tracer simulation, eventually the lights will turn green. Okay, they turn green on the top one. All right. So if I just plug one wire from one switch to another switch, there's about a 30 to 50 second delay before they'll start actually passing traffic and the link light will change from orange to green. Of course, if you have nothing plugged into the port, the link light just doesn't come on at all. Now look at the second wire. The second wire, one of the lights went to green and the other one went to orange. So we have this sort of, let's see, my mouse is visible here. So we have this sort of a loop here between ports one and one, and then through the switch and ports two and two. And we're gonna look at this, uh, this, this thing that switches do that are compelled to do when you, uh, connect them together and talk about why one of these switch ports is staying orange and has not stayed active yet because it would create a dangerous loop condition. 
Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing that and go back and start sharing our PowerPoint slideshow again. So that's being shared. Oh, good. Is that being shared? Good. Good, good. And that's actually, I've got to switch to the slideshow now, but I can see. Okay, so we're going to talk about this of redundancy. We normally like to connect. If we one wire would work, well, what happens if that wire gets dug up? Maybe it's a fiber optic cable between here and the library. And the number one enemy of fiber optic cables is backhoes. Well, they just dug up our campus across the, you know, right outside our front door. They dug up and they eliminated the, uh, the rotunda building, the starship, round shape building. And so it's possible when stuff like that happens, uh, uh, a fiber optic cable could be dug up. So if we run another fiber optic cable over sort of to the, to the south, to the academic classroom building, and then run another cable over to the library. If well, one of them gets dug up, the other one's still there and it can work. So we're going to look at, uh, uh, but that creates uh, loops. We're going to look at spanning tree protocol, which was invented to uh, fix that problem. STP for short, spanning tree protocol, the algorithm. And then we'll look at something called rapid spanning tree pre protocol, which the old original spanning tree protocol had a problem in that it took, it took almost a whole minute. Uh, before the lights would turn green. So if someone was demolishing the rotunda building and dug up the fiber optic cable, it could take up to a minute for the alternate path to come alive. And that's enough time for most applications to time out. Okay, so here we have three switches connected together. Let's see. The mouse showing here. The mouse is sort of showing here. Okay, so we have three switches connected together in a set of redundant connections. So if one of the wires between S, if the wire between S1 and S2 was dug up, there's still an alternate connection. Uh, S1 can go through S3 and then go back to S2. All our buildings will still be connected together. So we normally want redundancy. We normally run multiple fiber optic cables together. Um, so if one link fails, the link between S1 and S2 fails, there's a backup path. If, um, if switch three failed, well, now there's a backup path that can go through switch one, and these PC one, two, three, and four would still have some connectivity between each other. But the problem is, when you have this redundancy, it actually creates a loop. And so here are the three big problems that I'm gonna illustrate. Um, if all the links were to remain active, we would get uh, broadcast storms, which would immediately overwhelm the entire network. We could get multiple copies of frames when we should only receive one. And the MAC address uh, tables, the switch tables, and the switches would be inconsistent with each other. So let's look at all those problems. So here we got four switches connected together. Okay, so we got the 12 o'clock one, the three o'clock one, the six o'clock one, and the nine o'clock one. Now let's talk for a second about the, the normal things that a what are the normal things that a Ethernet switch will do when you send a broadcast into him? So let me see. Is he going to send a broadcast here? Oh, okay. Let's send an ARP request. That's a broadcast. When ARP requests are sent into port three of the switch at the at the nine o'clock position, it's going to be flooded out to all of the other ports. Hold on, I'm checking checking. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We got someone new who came in here. So the broadcast, uh, the red arrow broadcast here flows into port number three. And what is the switch compelled to do when he receives a broadcast? An ARP request is a broadcast because he doesn't know which particular uh, other machine he's asking for his, uh, for his uh, MAC address. So it's broadcasted or flooded. Broadcasts are flooded through all the other ports on switch at the nine o'clock switch, except the one it came in on. It doesn't do that one. But all the others it floods through. So what happens next? It goes into the switch at the 12 o'clock and six o'clock position. They flood. It goes to the switch at the three o'clock position. He floods. 
That little host machine on the right is probably the one that he's doing the ARP request for, so he can learn his MAC address and you know send a email or something to him. But now what's happening? Now they're flooded back and forth. It goes on and on forever until the entire network is overwhelmed with, with a bunch of needless, excessive duplicate copies of the original broadcast request. And all of a sudden, nobody can log in. Everything slows down to a crawl. And uh, uh, and all the IT guys are getting called, and they're, that network stopped. You got to fix it. It's networking is not working. OK, that's the first problem is uh, broadcast storms, because that's the nature of broadcast. OK, now let's look at multiple frame transmissions. A sends out a frame to workstation B. He learned his MAC address, OK, so he doesn't need to ARP him anymore. So it's just a unicast, just a regular unicast, not a broadcast. So A, it's an unknown unicast to port A because he doesn't know B. He doesn't know B's uh, MAC address yet. So he's going to flood it. He floods it to the top switch at 12 and the bottom of the switch at 6 o'clock. It gets flooded to the switch at the 3 o'clock position. And the frame arrives at host B. And then the second frame arrives. He gets two copies of the single unicast frame when he should have only gotten one. So depending on the application that he's running, he could, it could make the machine crash. It could confuse the heck out of him. Or he may just recover from it. But it's a problem. OK, uh, the MAC address tables that are present in the switches. Switch host A sends a frame to host B. It goes into the first switch at the 9 o'clock position. Again, it gets flooded. And then it gets flooded to the switch at the 3 o'clock position. And then the switch, the MAC address table on that switch says, wait a minute, A, the, that unique MAC address is on port 1 and port 2 at the same time? That's not allowed. We're not allowed. Two individual devices can't have the same MAC address. So we get inconsistent switch tables on the switches. So those are the three big problems. Mac, uh, uh, broadcast storms, um, uh, duplicate frames, and inconsistent MAC address tables on the switches. So everything gets messed up. Oh, look at uh, the back of the original switch. Now he thinks that post A is present on three ports at the same time. Oh, dear. Also, maybe loops could be set up by mistake. So here we are inside the wiring closet. And somebody moves a wire from one point to the other. and they accidentally create a loop between you know, two switches or all these other devices. And they were meaning to plug in the new vice president of marketing and equity and so forth like that. And instead, they created a loop. So th there's an exception. And we're going to talk about this in the next PowerPoint presentation. Normally, if I run two wires between S3 and S1, like they're shown here with the dotted lines, the dashed lines, there would be broadcast storms. But STP is going to prevent that. However, we're going to lose one of the wires. We're not going to get the full transmission rate. You know, 10 gigabit optical fiber will only get 10 instead of 20. So Ether channel, which is link aggregation, uh, Cisco's proprietary term for this is Ether channel. Uh, if we take those two wires and sort of bond them together and tell the switches to pretend it's one big fat wire, uh, he won't he won't partition one of them off, and we'll get the full 20 gigabits between them. We'll get the combined bandwidth. We'll get that in the next one coming up soon. OK, so back to our STP problem. We want redundancy, but we don't want loops. There just needs to be one active path between any one arbitrary point and any other arbitrary point in the network. The redundant paths, they have to be sort of disabled. I don't like the word shut down here. They're not really shut down. That's administratively shut down. They're sort of on, in a standby mode. Um, so and if the backhoe comes in and digs up a fiber optic cable, it should be able to recover fairly quickly. Even in the old STP, it was, took place within 30 to 50 seconds. There's a rapid span entry protocol also that does it in a matter of a second or two. So that's the job of span entry protocol. What? What is a spanning tree? It's a tree or an extended star topology with no loops, and all devices are connected. Oh, what the heck does that mean? Well, this is not a spanning tree. There are loops, multiple paths back and forth. So it's not a spanning tree. Now, this is a spanning tree, but there's a device left out. It doesn't have all devices connected. It doesn't span all devices. It's almost there, but not quite. OK, well, here is a loop. That, here's a spanning tree that has no loops. There's no circular path between any of the devices. We can't have any broadcast storms. We can't have any inconsistent MAC address tables. We can't have any duplicate frame delivery here. But we have no redundancy. 
So if one of these paths, one of these fiber optic cables between buildings and a campus environment got dug up, we would lose connectivity, would chop our network into pieces. So spanning tree protocol is, was made up so that we could have them with, with make actual loops, redundant connections, but just make sure that the one fastest connection is activated and all the others are sort of in a backup standby state. So what we're gonna do is uh, locate the fastest wires, or if there's a tie, we'll, we'll just you know use the lowest port number or something. And all the other ones that we create a loop, we're gonna just block them. Uh, and we call it blocking or alternating the port, so it's not, not used right now. Um, the IEEE engineers have all their 802 dot specifications for everything, you know, like 802.3 is standard Ethernet, 802.11 is Wi-Fi. So 802.1D is the old standard STP that's been around for quite a while, uh, since like the early 90s. Uh, a newer standard is rapid spanning tree protocol, which it, the big problem was the 30 to 50 second delay when we want to recover from a loop. We have the one back wire goes bad, we have to switch to a backup wire. So that's 802.1W. You don't need to configure STP. All switches that are managed switches, enterprise quality switches, they run STP. Not just Cisco switches that all do, and they'll all work with each other just fine. You don't need to configure anything, but we do need to understand how it works. Now, if you go to Office Depot and buy a $15 switch that's not managed, it doesn't have any STP. So that's one of the reasons why we have to sign our acceptable use agreements in an enterprise. We agree not to buy a switch and put it in the cubes and run it from one to the other because we just created a loop and we're going to have broadcast storms. So we have to let our professional IT department handle all the switches for us and have the enterprise quality switches that are more expensive, but we, we want to maintain connectivity in the company. So here is the, something called the spanning tree algorithm. Algorithm, thank you, Al Gore, for inventing algorithms and the internet. So this is a, algorithm is simply a, a, a lines of code or flow, flow chart to decide what you want to do. So what we're going to do is we're going to arbitrarily choose one switch to be our master reference point for the entire network. And we're going to call that to be the root bridge. Oh, you can call it a root switch if you want to, the old word for switches when they were just like two ports and they had software running everything was a, a bridge. And then when they had the 24 port bridges that came out in the mid nineties, the marketing people decided we can't call them bridges because everyone thinks bridges have too much latency. So we'll call them switches now. So we're gonna choose one switch to be the root bridge. And if you don't change anything to the contrary, that's gonna be one of the lowest MAC address which is burned to the hardware. We can overrule that now. If we want to choose, we want to choose a $50,000 powerful switch to be our root bridge, we can overrule that if it happens to have the wrong MAC address. Okay, number two, we're gonna choose a root port on all the other switches. The root port on all the other switches is gonna be their best path, most direct path back to the root bridge. Then we're gonna choose a designated port on the other side of each wire that's one side of the wire is a root port, the other side of that wiring segment will be the designated port. And all the other ports are, they're closed down. It's, they're not shut down. If you do a show IP interface brief, they will not say administratively shut down. They'll say they're up and up. But STP has placed them in a sort of a blocking or alternate mode where they're available to be used if the best path just becomes available at this time. So let's take a look at this process here. Okay, so the switch at the top, A, by some elven magic, it's been decided that this is going to be the root bridge. Maybe he happens to have the lowest MAC address. Maybe someone has gone and configured him with a priority command we'll see later to be the root bridge because it's the central bridge and the most expensive uh, switch in the topology. So every other switch, B, C, and D, are going to choose the fastest path back to the root bridge. And they will designate that one port on switch B will designate his one port to be the root port. This is my best way back to my most direct back to A. This is more direct than going this way. And root and switch C is going to choose his root port back to A. Now D has got to go through a couple hops. Well, he's going to go to B and then directly to A. He would go to D and then go to C and go to A. That's too many hops. So each one of these uh, uh, 
switches will choose his best path back and turn on that port and call it the root port. The other end of each wiring segment, where one end is the root port, the other end will be called the designated port, and that will be an active link between bridge B and bridge A, between switch C and switch A, between D and B and A. Now, what about this little lonely port over here? If I turn that on, if STP wasn't running, that would create a loop, and we would get broadcast storms and all these other problems. So STP is going to turn on all the, the, the uh, most optimum paths and disable those others. So that port on C, it's, 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 he says close down. That, that, that implies it's shutdown command, administrative shutdown. It's not that. It's alternated or blocked. But it's ready to take over. It's listening. It's waiting. It wants to perform the palace coup and take over, and he wants to become the root bridge. He's always waiting to take over. Okay, let's choose. Let's see how we determine what this root bridge is. Uh, each switch has got a bridge ID that's determined by its MAC address, and there's a default priority value. So that if I don't change that priority value, the only thing that's going to decide which switch becomes the root bridge will be the MAC address. It's an accent of the MAC addresses. So switches send out every two seconds when they see a connection to another switch, they send out bridge protocol data units telling them what their MAC addresses are and what their priority values are. Each of them, all the switches, when they're first connected together, each switch says, well, I want to be the root bridge. And then he'll listen to all of the MAC addresses and priority values from the other switches. And if another one sends them another lower value, which says, well, I have a lower MAC address, I should be the root, he'll defer to him. Now, you as administrator, if you want to not be dependent upon an action of whatever MAC addresses are present, you probably want to choose your switch that's in the core of your topology and that's a more expensive, you know, $50,000 switch or a million dollar switch. You can set it to be the root bridge. So you can, uh, doesn't matter what the MAC address is, if you choose this, choose this, you can simply lower the priority value and you can make it be the root bridge because you want that root bridge to have the fastest CPU and fastest processing power. So the bridge ID that all these switches send out consists of uh, the bridge priority value. By default, it's 32,768. That's a 16-bit value. Uh, 2 to the power of 16 is 65,536. So it's halfway in between. So he uses this uh, default value. If you want to take your more expensive switch and make sure that because he happens to have the wrong MAC address, it's not the lowest one, just change his priority value. We'll use the values of 1 through 65,536, but we have to use multiples of 4096 because they stole some of the bits away from this original value because VLANs came on the scene. The extended system ID is the VLAN number. Uh, when this protocol was first invented, there was no such thing as VLANs. But when VLANs came on the scene later on in the 90s, they had to steal some bits from this field to identify the VLAN number because each VLAN is a separate broadcast domain. Why? Each VLAN has a separate instance of the STP protocol. So if the MAC address, if the priority values are the default out of the box value, he, whatever, whichever switch has the lowest MAC address, he will become the root bridge. So we shouldn't rely on that. We should, use it for, we should do it ourselves. So let's uh, say in this case that we decided that uh, uh, switch one is our $50,000 core switch and we want it to be the root. And it happens to have the wrong MAC address. Well, we can simply go to the iOS on that switch and say spanning tree, VLAN 1, and set a low priority value. Remember the default was 3,000, 30,000 or something? Or we can say root primary. And then we can take another switch and we can say root secondary. So there's a backup. Uh, it's like in Microsoft networks, you should have a primary domain controller and a secondary domain controller. Uh, in networking, you should have a primary bridge and you should have a secondary bridge in case something happens to the primary bridge. We call that fault tolerance. Uh, the idea of fault tolerance redundancy is that uh, any one device can fail and everything keeps running. It might not run quite as fast, uh, but we can still do stuff. Okay, so the root bridge, this, we're on the number one process here, choosing, electing the root bridge. So uh, and any one of our four switches starts up and they send out their bridge protocol data unit frames about every two seconds. 
At first, each switch says, well, I am, I am root, I'll hail me. If a switch hears a bridge protocol data unit from another switch with a lower bridge ID, then he says, oh, okay, I guess you get to be the root. So eventually all four of our switches in our topology will agree that one of the switches either had the lowest MAC address by default or some administrator went in and actually, actually configured this more powerful switch or this core switch in its position central point of the network to be the root bridge. So in our case, uh, number A, switch A has been chosen to be the root bridge because he either had the lowest MAC address or the administrator went in and configured him to have a better, more attractive value. So every other non-root bridge switch, he's gonna select this root port, which is the best path to the root bridge. We saw that earlier. How did they determine the cost? This has gotta be reduced to numbers. So the old method was, um, back in the days before gigabit and, fat and 10 gigabit, and now we got 100 gigabit stuff, uh, they used a, a method of, 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 remember that metrics have to be lower to be more attractive, so we have to sort of put the speed in the bottom of the fraction. So 100 megabit ethernet was uh, 10. Standard old 10 megabit ethernet was 100. But about 20 years ago, when these super fast Ethernet technologies started appearing on the scene, gigabit Ethernet, 10 gigabit Ethernet, they revised that the schedule, they revised that cost uh, so that it could handle the new upcoming technologies. So with our standard 100 megabit fast Ethernet ports we have on our switches, the cost is 19. And we'll see that same number pop up again in the, in the, next, four, in the next eight weeks when we talk about the OSPF. I can change this manually if I want to. Uh, probably not a good idea at the CCNA level to do this, uh, but if you want to do this for some CCNP, CCIE black magic reason, you might do this. Now, what if they have the same cost? Remember our, our D, they had to turn off one of the ports, the links on it, because it's the same cost. The cost is, from the standpoint of D, what's the cost to get back to A? Well, it's 19 plus 19, it's 38 this way. It's 19 plus 19, it's 38 this way. Which one am I going to choose? Well, if there's both equal costs, by default, he's going to choose the lower number port. Now, we can go in and modify this on the interface and change it if we want to. So if we use the default value, if we don't change the default value, the lower port will win. So in this case, the lower port on uh, one will become the active port and port two will be the, the backup port. So when the switches send these bridge protocol data unit information to each other, they include this cost information. And that's how they use this cost, just like we'll see with OSPF in the future, to determine the best path back to the location. Okay, we chose our root ports. Each D and B and C chose their root ports. Uh, the designated port, the other end of the wire turned on, except between B and C, which one gets turned on? Well, in this case, B has the lower bridge ID. So he'll, his one will be the designated port, and the one on the high, uh, one that had the highest MAC address, he'll partition that off. He'll, he'll become in the block mode or the alternating mode. Uh, bridge protocol data unit sent in the Ethernet frame while the Ethernet switches. Special multicast address for sending this information back and forth. Don't worry about this. So port roles, spanning tree protocol makes ports forwarding it's a root port or a designated port. It's actively forwarding the traffic. Non-designated ports, I don't like the word shutdown here. They're alternated or blocked. If you see the word shutdown, you think someone type shutdown or no shutdown on it, shutdown and turn it off. It's not exactly what happens. So here's the state. This is the 50 second delay when you plug in a wire and the light turns orange and doesn't turn green for 30 to 50 seconds. So in the blocking state, they're, of course, they're, they're, they're not shut down. If they're shut down, no traffic will be sent and received. Even a, a port that's in the alternating or block state is still listening to the bridge protocol data units because he has to be able to learn that the main link has gone down and he needs to take over now. So normally when you plug a wire into it, he goes through these states and eventually in about, about 50 seconds, he's in the forwarding state. He's fully active and he's forwarding user data. So if you tried to type a ping command, before the 50 seconds was up, it would fail, and you would think you made a programming error or config error or something like this. So here's, here's our timers. Initially, they're in the blocking state. It takes about 20 seconds for that to pass through. Then they're in the listening state for 15 seconds. 
Then they're in the learning state. They're actually listening to and putting MAC addresses just in their MAC address table. And this adds up, let's say I only went to public school, let's say it's 20 plus 15 plus 15, that's 50 seconds. And then they're in the forwarding state. So it takes about 50 seconds for that light to, it'll turn on amber when you first plug the wire in. And then after about 50 seconds, it'll turn to green and you actually be, can forward data back and forth. Uh, seven switch diameter network. Uh, timers shouldn't be messed with at the CCNA level, better not if you want to mess with this. Okay, now then, if it's a wire that's going from one switch to another switch, we definitely want STP in there because switches in a loop can create broadcast storms and other problems, so we want to be able to make sure that doesn't happen with STP. What about a wire that goes from a switch port to, it's an access switch that goes to users workstations or printers. Those can't create loops. I don't take a wire and plug it into a PC and then plug another wire from the PC into another switch. I plug one wire from one switch to my PC. So if it's an access port going to a workstation, it doesn't have to go through the STP modes because it won't be closed down. But it, it will still take 50 seconds for that amber light to change from amber to green. So we're allowed on a port that we know is only, only going to go to a host machine, not another switch to speed up the process. So we can use something called port fast. And so let's look at how we can verify spanning tree. We can type the command show span on the switch and it'll show us what his MAC address is and what is the MAC address of the root switch. This is after convergences take place and all the switches have agreed upon each other as to, you know, take care of all the loops and electric root bridges all taking place. So on this particular, on this particular switch, he has a root port, which goes back toward the root bridge, and he has a designated port. If something goes wrong, like a wire gets dug up by a backhoe, a cable, a fiber optic cable gets broken, we get the thing called a topology change notification. And this is how the, all the switches can figure out that, oh, something has happened and we need to reconverge. We need to check our costs all over again and try to converge as quickly as possible. It's gonna take 30 to 50 seconds in the old STP. The newer STP has a thing called the rapid STP, which does it much more quickly. So Cisco Proprietary has something called per VLAN spanning tree protocol, per VLAN spanning tree. And then there's a per VLAN spanning tree that supports the IEEE 802.1Q. That's our tagging for our VLANs. And then there's rapid. This is the one that's gonna eliminate the 50 second delay. Now IEEE standards, which all manufacturers support, Cisco and all the other switch manufacturers support this. We have rapid spanning tree and we have multiple spanning tree. So this is the default for our Cisco switches. Per, for each VLAN, there's gonna be an instance of spanning tree protocol. So for example, if we have VLAN 10 and VLAN 20, we need a spanning tree instance for each one of these. And to spread the load out, let's make switch three, the spanning tree protocol route for VLAN 20. And let's make S1 be the spanning tree protocol for route 10 and spread the load out. Of course, we're gonna do trunking cables between the switches where we do 802.1Q tagging and we can mix all this stuff together in this. So per VLAN spanning tree protocol plus is a default for our Catalyst 2960 switches. This is why we had to steal some bits from the bridge ID. And normally it had the whole 65,016 bits for the priority value, but we had to cut that down. And then we had to steal the bits, other bits for the, the VLAN identification. So rapid spanning tree protocol is a newer development that is compatible, it's backwards compatible with the old STP, but it converges much more rapidly. Same structure of the bridge protocol data units. Use a different way of timers. Uh, it converges much more rapidly. Now an edge port is a port that you, you, you promise, you swear to the switch that you will never plug this port into another switch and have the possibility of creating a loop. It goes to an employee's desktop PC or student PC or a printer or something like this. So if I can want this, I want this to go to the forwarding state right away in one second. It's like port fast. So it's the same command 
that we did not see before, but this is the command, spanning tree port fast. I go interface faster than it's zero slash five, or it's zero slash six, that's going to PCA. And I say spanning tree port fast. And if I enter that command and plug the wire in for my PC, it'll turn green right away. However, he doesn't trust you if you take that wire and unplug it from the host machine and you plug it through the switch. He knows he's connected to another switch now. And you said, you promised you wouldn't be connecting me to another switch. But I hear bridge protocol data units. So I'm immediately going to stop this fast thing and go back. OK, uh, full duplex between two switches is a point to point link. Normally, we're going to run full duplex Ethernet between two switches at a gigabit Ethernet or 10 gigabit Ethernet, probably with fiber optic cables between buildings. In our labs, we just use standard copper twisted pair. Half duplex is a shared link. No one uses shared links anymore. We're not using any hubs, old hubs. If we had to plug the hub in, it had to be a shared link. So if it's a point to point link, and we're using modern technology, good, we're going to be able to afford better. So here's our states with the old spanning tree protocol. We were in the blocking state. In the new rapid tree, it's called discarding, does the same thing. No traffic is passed. In the next 15 seconds, we listen, but we're discarding traffic. In the next 15 seconds, we're learning MAC addresses. We're putting them in the MAC address table. And finally, after this, remember, it was 20 plus 15 plus 15. 50 seconds later, the light changes from amber to green, and we're actually forwarding traffic. A port that is disabled in the old STP is the same thing. It's just called discarding. So the role, the ports are just the same, except we use them slightly different names. And the alternate port is ready. To, if, the, if the designated port fails, this designated port fails, I've got a backup path. So when the, the guy dug up the cable and this wire is chopped up, I can very rapidly, with rapid spanning tree protocol, it's going to take one or two seconds. And that's fast enough that most applications don't time out. So we still have our root bridge, and we still have our root ports, and we still have our designated ports. And the backup port is ready to take over if the root port fails. OK, so uh, forwarding root ports and designated ports forward data. An edge port, that's, that's spanning tree port fast. That goes to a, a PC that doesn't connect to another switch. So a backup port, alternate port, they're, they're not shut down. They're in a standby state, but they're listening to the bridge protocol data units. And if something goes wrong, they're ready to take over at a moment's notice. So the root bridge should be a powerful switch in the center of the network, not a cheap $500 switch like we use. And we want to minimize the number of ports that need to be shut down by STP. Uh, one thing, well, uh, VLAN trunking protocol is no longer a CCNA objective, uh, but we can prune those. These This is similar to allow VLANs on our trucks. Use layer three switches in the core. So uh, the next time you come in the lab, look over in the back near the printer, and there's about a $20,000 Cisco model $4,000 switch. It's a layer three switch. I hate that word. It has Ethernet plugs in it, and it has a router on a board, which they call the supervisor module, but it's a router. That's a layer three switch. We can run OSPF or something between devices and that. And we should always keep SDP running, even if no ports need to be shut down, because you never know when some jack leg technician is going to go in the wiring closet and create a problem. OK, good. Now I need to get to end this one. And before I go to the other one, I'm going to stop. Oh, I blew his mind. OK. So let's go back to our application for packet tracer. And OK, but I can see packet tracer. Good. Now I'm going to bring up the uh, consoles here. I need to be in the CLI mode. So I'm going to show the spanning tree. And I'll do show spec a little as well, so we can compare them. Oh, well, that's the topic for So S1 is the root. We can know because it says, hey, this bridge is the root. And the listing of the root bridge MAC address is the same on both lines. And the weird thing about root bridges you can always tell it's a root bridge by two things. It says this bridge is the root, and it has no root ports. Root bridges don't have root ports. Only other 
switches have root ports. So when we look at the second switch, well, he's got a root port. Port one to port one, well, lowest numbered port number wins. I didn't change the priority value. So what happened to port number two? He was blocked. He's the alternate port. If See, here he is. He's red here. He's been blocked. Otherwise, we get broadcast storm. Okay, now we're going to go into the chapter on Ether channel and see how, right now, I've only got 100 megabit of connectivity between switch one and switch two. I would rather get 200 megabits with both wires connected together. Let's bond them together with Ether channel and see if we can make that cost go down from 19 to a lower value and make these two ports uh, sort of virtually become one port between them. Okay, good. Now we're ready to do this. I'll stop sharing this. And I'll start sharing. Let me make sure my PowerPoint slideshow is proper here. It looks like it's okay. Okay, so share application window PowerPoint slideshow. Okay, so Ether Channel is our technology. Make sure this is showing properly for you guys. That looks good. And hold on a second while I check attendance. Let's see who's not here yet. Oh, that mouse doesn't work, that computer. Hold on. Okay, this is called leak aggregation. This is, means take two or more wires and aggregate them or glump them together. So if I have like four fiber optic cables and they're one gig each, I can get four gig. So, uh, and that gives us some redundancy. It gives us more bandwidth. It gives us redundancy. If one of the wires fails, I still have, if one of the fiber optic cables fail, fails, I still have three gig of connectivity left. So anytime... Anytime you want to put an order to your to your contractor to run fiber optic cable, run 24 of them. The cost is going to be about the same. The fiber optic cable itself is not that expensive compared to the labor cost. And that way you have lots of spare wires that you can use in case one of them goes bad. It's much more expensive to come back in later and add this later, add this later. So we can have multiple links between devices and increase the bandwidth. The problem is the spanning tree protocol, which is enabled on all not just Cisco switches by default, all enterprise quality managed switches. I've got this. That's gonna block the redundant links. So I have four fiber optic cables between here and the library, three of them are turned off. They're blocked, they're alternate. So what we wanna do is get the two switches to agree between themselves to treat these four fiber optic cables as one sort of a pseudo fake connection that's four gig of technology. And not, and STP will say, oh, it's one big fat wire. I'll treat it as one wire and I won't block it. So Cisco calls that. That's their proprietary term is Ether channel. So this is going to allow us to group multiple Ethernet links together in one single link. In the lab you guys do on Thursday, you're going to take the fast Ethernet connection between one and one of the two switches and two and two. And as we saw a second ago, one of them was partitioned off. And they're going to be one logical link. It's going to be instead of 100 megabit of bandwidth, it's going to be 200 total megabits of bandwidth. So this gives us some load sharing, gives us some fault tolerance if one of the wires goes bad. Increased bandwidth, we double our bandwidth, and gives us redundancy. So Ether Channel allows us to do this with Cisco devices. Well, it has to be at least fast Ethernet. And all the ports have to be the same technology. I can't take a copper port and a fiber core port and bond them together. But we're allowed to create about six Ether Channel groups if we want to. So here we have two fiber optic cables between the switch at the bottom, which is like an access layer switch, like the ones that go to our student workstations. And then for redundancy purposes, we're going to the library with two fiber optic cables, but we're also going to the uh, academic classroom building uh, with another set of fiber optic cables. In case one of them gets dug up, we have a backup connection. And we're gonna bond these two wires together. Uh, I'm pretty sure that we're running 10 gigabit ethernet over fiber optic cable at the South Campus. So these two wires, when bonded together, these two fiber optic cables will give a total of 20 gigabits of traffic to the academic building and 20 gigs of traffic. 
to the library building. Now, not shown as all the other connections that connect the campus together. So we're going to bundle them together. So this way, after I, we're going to see the code for this in just a little bit, the, the configuration code for this. We're going to create a, a, a channel group, port channel one, port channel two. And then it's going to be treated as a single link, even though it's really two wires or four wires. or I think the limit is eight. So Ether channel uses existing switch ports. I don't need to get a more expensive fiber optic cable. If I just need more bandwidth between buildings, I can just use more ports on the switch. The probably the most practical thing to do with our access layer 2960 switches would be the two gigabit ports. It has 24 fast Ethernet ports, and they have two gigabit copper ports, or you can plug in a little transceiver and use fiber optic cable. Use those two gigabit ports and bond them together, and you got two gig of bandwidth to the other building. So we can use our existing ports. There is a sort of a load balancing that takes place, which means that they'll send part of the traffic on one wire and part of the traffic on the other wire. So everybody gets the benefit of the double bandwidth. So Ether Channel aggregates these together. It looks like one logical link. Um, if I create more than one bundle, well, STP may block one of them. So we're typically going to use only one bundle, although I think you're allowed up six or something like that. So this gives us redundancy. OK, here are, here's the gotchas. Uh, cannot mix interface types, so fast Ethernet, gigabit Ethernet, can't be mixed in both twisted pair RG45s. Uh, up to eight ports can be bonded together. So if I used eight fast Ethernet ports, I'd get 800 megabit. If I used eight gigabit Ethernet ports, I would get eight gig. If I used eight fiber optic 10 gigabit, I'd get 80 gigabit. So our switches, our 2960 switches, oh, I've got to remember this correctly, up to six Ether channel, uh, port channel, channel groups together. We're just going to do one. Um, the ports that are configured must be consistent. In other words, if they're access ports on one port, they have to be access port on the other port. If they're trunking ports, they're going to be trunking on it. Now, we're always going to use trunking between switches. I can't think of any reason you would want to use an access port between switches because you only have one broadcast domain. You want to be trunking ports so you can, you know, not waste ports and get all of your VLANs, all your subnets in your company together. So they got to be consistent. And so we're going to create a logical port channel. It's going to show up when we do Sharpie Interface Brief. There's going to be a new channel called PO1, Port Group 1. And then we'll make that a uh, access port. No, we're not going to make an access port. We'll make it a trunking port so that we can trunk.
Oh dear, I've had the mic turned off all this time. Okay, so. So now we've formed the port channel group and the amber light has gone out on the, uh, on the other router here. And we're getting our full bandwidth here. So let's do a show. Oh, here we go. Show interfaces. Channel one. What show? What call does that work? And it's not implemented on Packet Tracer. Okay. So there's a problem with Packet Tracer. If I do show interface status, he still thinks that port channel one is in VLAN one, it's actually a tracking port. So the show uh, interface status is not implemented properly on this. Okay, so we've got our two switches configured with each other and you're gonna be do something to this very similarly in the lab that you do on Thursday. Oh dear, I missed the chat message. Okay, so yes, Mr. Caleb, I'm so sorry. I, I accidentally turned off the microphone to clear my throat and I didn't get activated again for a couple of minutes. Okay. So we've illustrated um, we've illustrated the Ether channel. We've illustrated STP. We promoted the two ports to to, get, to bypass the problem that STP, which which won't allow you to use both wires together, made them port channel groups with Ether channel, and now they're talking to each other just fine. Okay, so I think I've covered that, everything I need to do now. So. Please report, uh, you guys that report in person, please come Thursday and we'll do these labs in person. And I've already got them wired up, so you should be able to successfully uh, do these labs in the, in the SBS 1125 South Campus Lab. Okay, I'm going to stop now. That's all I got for you guys. I'll hang loose for a second in case there's any chat questions, and then we'll call it a day. Thank you for joining us today. See you guys Thursday.